Okay. Uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? And then. And also uh, what you're doing here at uh, Media, Media Channel, yeah, your blog. And yeah, yeah. I'm Danny Schechter, known as the News Dissector. I edit uh, MediaChannel.org, the world's largest online media issues network. I write a blog every morning. I write books about media issues, and I'm making a film about the media coverage of the war in Iraq. So I'm a busy guy, and I'm making some time out to talk to you about this because it's so important. Okay, great. And. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, also your history of um, working as a producer? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, I come to this work, this uh, work of kind of, I come to criticizing media having worked in major media. I was part of the startup team at CNN. I worked for ABC News for eight years. And so I have more than a passing acquaintance with how networks operate. Uh, and we ourselves, as producers at Global Vision, have produced programmings for public television stations and cable channels for many, many years. So we've worked in the industry. We're not outsiders in that sense, although in terms of our perspective, we, we're far more critical probably than many people working in the business. And uh, can you kind of give your evaluation of both the print and television news media leading up to the war in Iraq? Well, you know, the, the problem is when you have what's called a buy-in, when the media institutions in our country basically have a consensus with the government and have been persuaded that there's a threat to the United States, that Saddam Hussein is this menace uh, to the world, when the, uh, we're told that there are these weapons that could be turned over to terrorists. In the aftermath of the World Trade Center, there's a lot of belief that's suspended, you know. People are saying, my God, we've got to do something. We can't let this happen again. And in and, and that environment, kind of patriotic correctness, a lot of the media organizations basically became a, uh, a transmission belt for government claims and did not challenge them. Uh, now, you know, a couple of years, a year later, we begin to have some media outlets like the New York Times and the Washington Post carrying articles saying, oh my God, we didn't do a very good job. But back then, they were basically enlisted in this great crusade, this war against terror, this uh, battle against the evildoers. And you, know, in, and you had an administration that's saying, hey, it's either us or them. Who do you side with? And many media companies said, well, we sign with you, of course. You know, we're scared too. And in that environment, we saw uncritical, patriotically correct uh, coverage that was uh, jingoism posing as journalism. Okay, great. And um, there's, it seems to me that the, the rock certainly was covered, um, and there's the sins of omission and the sins of commission. So can you first describe the nature of the coverage that was happening? Well, first of all, most coverage is not about Iraq. Most coverage of the world is not about the world. It's about Americans in the world and American policy about the world. So when Iraq was a friend of the United States, when it was fighting and against Iran and being subsidized by the United States, guess what? Uh, Iraq, uh, you know, was, was uh, treated in a very friendly way by our media. We have to stop for a second. Can you open the door? Somebody sure. just walked in here. I don't know who it is. Can you just find out for me? Sorry. How am I doing? You're doing great. Okay. Hello? No, people went to the door. Could you go to the left? There was somebody looking for me or not? I don't know who that was. All right, never mind. It doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Okay. All right, fine. Okay. Let's go. All right. All right. So, about uh, the nature of that coverage, uh, what types of things were they covering? Well, 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 you know, in the history of Iraq, Iraq was, you know, an important country uh, to the United States, particularly after. Uh, the Mossadegh government was elected in Iran, and there was this kind of wave of nationalism throughout the Middle East. The United States wanted to put a break on that to some degree, and Saddam Hussein was a sort of, you know, a thug, 
uh, you know, this Ba'athist party, which was very convenient for American policymakers at that time to support. When he gets the power, his first really uh, task is to kill all the communists. He was seen as in the Cold War as being a great friend of the United States until certain differences began to emerge, both in terms of American policy in the region and American policy towards Iraq. In the Reagan administration, you know, Saddam Hussein was a friend of the United States, basically. You know, he gassed the Kurds, but probably with gas sold to him by the United States. So there were a lot of stories that weren't being told about who Saddam was, about human rights in Iraq, about uh, American strategy in the Middle East and the relationship with dictatorships and royal families and, and uh, you know, all kinds of people who were mostly interested in pumping oil out of the region. And, and uh, American oil companies were mostly interested in getting that oil pumped to us uh, when it was in our interest to do so. So, yeah, I mean, I Iraq as a country and as a history is unknown to most Americans. Therefore, it's easy when you simplify it. You simplify it into being like there's this one guy who's, who's a horrible dictator. One man, he's like Hitler, you know, and the, the rest of Iraq kind of fades from view. All you're looking at is this one guy. It's, it's him. And, and Iraq becomes Saddam in an age of images and impressions. So the United States waged a very effective propaganda campaign in the world media to demonize uh, Iraq and demonized Saddam Hussein. Uh, the war took place in Kuwait. It was a dispute between Kuwait and Iraq. Iraq invaded Kuwait with the essential, con you know, agreement of the United States. They said, "Look, it's your. We don't get involved in inter-Arab disputes." And yet he goes in there, and the U.S. changes its mind, decides to make an example of him. We have Gulf War One, uh, followed by you know, ten or twelve years of sanctions which were crushing to the people of Iraq that were never really covered, okay? And as a consequence of all of this, when the 2003 invasion, the run-up to the war, most people didn't have much background or context for understanding what was happening. Okay, great. And uh, can you talk about, um, you, you made some analogies about sports and uh, there's no questioning of, of why. And can you describe how the coverage leading up to the war was uh, like sports coverage? And well, you know, the coverage of the war was like a sporting event. You know, we went from here to there. We invaded uh, Iraq. It was, uh, you know, kind of a straight line. It was a series of maneuvers and plays. We'll go into Nasiriyah. We'll go around the back. We'll head to, you know, uh, through Fallujah and come into Baghdad in the back door. You know, it was like, it was a, like a sports commentary. But in the run-up to the war, in the, in the, you know, there was a kind of different game being played. It was a game, but it was a different game. And it was a game of trying to build support for the notion of unilateral invasion, preemptive invasion. And the Bush administration announced its policies. Then the Powell people and others said, look, you've got to go through the UN. They try to get a second resolution, and they failed. And then they said, well, the hell with the UN. We're going to go in to enforce UN resolutions, which, of course, the UN didn't ask them to do. And that led, you know, kind of created a pretext for an invasion, which was supported by some countries, a few, uh, and was opposed by most people in the world. On February 15th, 2003, you had two main forces in the world, according to the New York Times, the force of global public opinion against the war and the power of the United States waging the war. Okay, and can you talk about the uh, branding of the coverage as Road to War, Showdown with Saddam, Countdown? Well, Iraq? packaging and branding is part of our television system. And we found in the networks that by, but by uh, creating special events and giving those special events a signature, their own music, their own graphics, their own sort of positioning, we were able to promote and market them better. You know, and so we've seen this, you know, election 2000, you know, uh, the OJ trial, you know, uh, in, you know, Clinton on trial, you know, these, kind, these kinds of packaging approaches is part of the way modern television is packaged. So the war was packaged this way also, but so was Gulf War I, uh, and so was a lot of other conflicts in the same way, because if you create a sense of crisis around something, more viewers will be drawn to watch it. So by hyping it up with music, effects, what they call video enhancement, 
elements, graphics, and the like, you're trying to bring more people to the tube, uh, which translates into higher ratings and higher revenues. And can you talk about the, um, the balance between the bottom line and the integrity of the news? That uh... Well, you know, our media system is a commercial media system. Uh, it's increasingly run by fewer and fewer companies that have bottom line concerns that drive their strategies. If you spend $19 billion, as Disney did, to buy ABC, you have to pay on that money. You're going to have you know, a big mortgage, so to speak, if it was a house. And where is it going to come from? It's going to come from sales. It's going to come from cutbacks and cutting your costs. It's going to come from trying to be as popular as possible to attract audiences, which will attract advertisers. So this is the kind of way the media functions. The television networks are there to sell eyeballs to advertisers. That's their real business, okay? And when you're in that real business, you want to try to find a way to attract people to news. Now, what began to happen was that people stopped, were, were, fewer and fewer people were watching news, or, the, or because of cable, the market was being segmented and divided. So you didn't have the same major audiences that network news once had. You had all these cable news networks, you had news you know, all around the clock. As a result, people weren't all gathering around their TVs at six o'clock or for the, for the network news. So the news business had changed. And as it became more hyper-competitive, uh, it began to use entertainment uh, techniques to sell itself. So you had a merger between news biz and show biz. And it's that merger uh, in which the war became a subset. You know, we had militainment. During elections, we have electotainment. Uh, you know, it's an entertainment-driven strategy, which is very successful in bringing audiences in. Most news doesn't build big audiences because why? A, the way it's presented is often very boring. Uh, it's often very repetitive. It's often people don't learn anything new. As a result, uh, there's been a tune out of a lot of news. And that's why networks have resorted to news magazines and other formats to try to bring more viewers to the tube. I'm, I'm going on too long, aren't I? No, I'm giving you like a whole that's good. history a, of a analysis lot of, here. Yeah, a lot of, okay. A lot of, that's good. You asked yeah. me to talk about something. I just keep talking. <laughs> that's fine. I'm like that's in good. a yak situation here. Go ahead. Right. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, you know how they they covered the um, legality of the whole in intervention? Well, you know, ordinarily, if the United, if a government, ordinarily, if a government makes a claim, you then subject that claim to the test of truth. You go out and find experts uh, to comment on it. How uh, reasonable an interpretation of the law is this? If, however, you sort of see the wars have being in your interest too, as a network, as a way to build viewership and uh, build revenues, uh, you know, then you don't want to create throw too many monkey wrenches into the whole mix here. And so we've seen that. And, so, so, you know, legality of the war, uh, you know, there are a lot of legal experts challenging it. Were they interviewed? Were they on the air very much? I didn't see them, did you? No, I don't know. Um, now, as the, uh, do you feel that the, the television news actually rewards the type of uh, war correspondence, of Pentagon correspondence uh, with uh, you know, is that what's valued within? Uh, well, we have we have a beat system. Okay, if you're covering uh, sports, you go to the sports division. If you're covering the military, you go to the military correspondence. If you're covering the White House, you go to the White House correspondence. They have a beat system of how things get covered. Now, the problem is, you know, people who are on a beat want access from that beat. They don't want to be cut out or frozen out. So they tend to get along by going along. They don't. Uh, ask too many disturbing questions. They don't challenge uh, too much because they don't want to be isolated. Let's say it's a breaking story and they go to the, your competitor instead of you. So this is a way of enforcing a kind of conformity of approach, a deferential approach to coverage. That's why at the presidential press conferences you have all these people who are, according to one author, on bended knee. They're treating the president C and the president with incredible deference and not challenging uh, the coverage. In 2004, there was a, a, an Irish journalist who challenged President Bush, and he was in a state of shock that somebody would really come back at him and challenge him. Because so we don't see that kind of journalism in America. We do see it in other countries. And so, you know, you have a system here of, of, uh, 
almost a kind of collegial approach. It's not a confrontational approach. It's not a controversial approach. Uh, you know, and the consequence of it is that people in authority uh, are perceived as being authoritative. If the Secretary of Defense says something, well, my God, he's the, he should know. He's a, in other words, you don't like question his political agenda, what is the basis of his assertion, uh, could he have a reason for stating the information the way he has. In other words, there's a tendency to be more accepting uh, of the media, and that's uh, you know, one of the big problems we have here. But what I'm talking about here are institutional problems. You know, most people who are anti-war people and activists, they, they, they're like partisan. You know, he's a liar! He's doing this! You know, they don't look at the institution, the way institutions work and why they work the way they do and how to try to challenge that. And that's the problem here, you know, is that you look at the coverage and you say, oh my God, they lied, you know? But this is the, their routine of coverage. This is how they cover everything, okay? If it bleeds, it leads in Iraq. If it bleeds, it leads in Harlem. It's the same approach to journalism. It's top down, okay? It's not bottom up. It's not outside in. It's inside. It's, it, you know, it, it's a, an approach where the guy goes and stands in front of a building with a microphone and behind me is the such and such a thing happening. We don't see it. We don't really get access to it. So there's a whole way in which news and reality are often worlds apart. And we saw that during the Iraq war. Okay. Four more minutes, does that sound good? Yeah. Okay. Um, How am I doing? You're doing great. Lots of energy, lots of emotion. Is it okay that you want to try to put down? Oh, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Does not matter if it changes? No, well, no. Okay. Only a few people will notice the continuity error. Uh, let's see. Uh, talk a little bit about, on the eve of war, you, you, uh, you talk a little bit in your book about almost being a New Year's Eve. Oh, you've read my book, huh? Oh, you have a thorough investigation. <laughs> well, you know, it was like the countdown. It was like a countdown to, to New Year's Eve. The big clock was going to come down. Dun, 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 dun. You know, 24 hours to war. 20, showdown with Saddam. You know, we saw this kind of hyping up the idea of confrontation and conflict. We didn't see, let's find out how can we avoid this? What are conflict resolution experts? What are things that could be done? That, why is this inevitable? Why do we have to do this this way? And that's the big problem, that this is not really questioned. Okay, and um, some isolated incidents that happened during the buildup. Uh, talk a little bit about Dan Rather's uh, interview with Saddam Hussein. Oh, turn a well, bit. well, I mean, Dan oh, Rather. Just turn your uh, your right shoulder towards. Yeah, the I mean, what was interesting was that Dan Rather, in his. Okay, in well, we just want to get that plane. Okay, go ahead. Dan Rather interviews Saddam Hussein. He's got the big get as we call it in television. He's in his hotel room primping. He, he reports on it. He's looking at the mirror. He's asking his questions. What will Saddam say? He's organizing his interview for this. CBS, meanwhile, not only has the Iraqi translator, but it has a Hollywood actor with an Iraqi accent who's actually translating. So it's a sort of a show business effort. They're upset because the Iraqis want to shoot it. CBS can't shoot it, you know. So there's this concern about, you know, will they get the story and will they get it out? In the end, you know, uh, Saddam Hussein says, I would like to be in a TV debate with Bush. Of course, the White House dismisses it. Does CBS uh, try to stage a debate? Does they try to call for a debate? No, of course not. They just go along with it. And the whole idea was, you know, see the, the, you know, the big bad wolf. And that was Saddam Hussein in this interview, who was, who was actually pretty reasonable. Now, of course, he's a deceptive, uh, you know, person also. He's got his own agenda. You know, he's propagandizing. You know, he's coming from a different worldview, clearly, than, than Bush. But for most Americans, it was hard for them to understand because, like, if he'll make a reference to something, you know, on March 1st, 1991, such and such, nobody remembers that. Nobody knows what he's talking about. And so we present information stripped of context and background. And, and the Dan Rather interview is really to put Dan Rather on the same level as Saddam Hussein. It was like, uh, you know, the two power sources in the world, television and you know, the, the, the man who was the, the, the uh, man that the United St uh, States loves to hate, you know, and it made it was a gross like a championship wrestling match. Okay. And uh, if you were, you know, hypothetically. Can I make a suggestion to you as a producer? Sure. Here's a good idea, okay? Follow up on a question. I say something. You say, well, what do you mean by that? How can you say that? That's nonsense. 
engage the interview. You'll get better interviews. If you just say, tell me about this, talk well, to me about that. I've been doing I know that, you're going to edit it. This is a 15-minute uh, interview, so I'm, try I'm trying to uh, okay. go down my list of All right, fine. an hour interview questions. Fine. So. Okay, I'm trying to help you. But, okay. Uh, uh, yeah. You'd get more out of me that way. Go ahead. Um, the, uh, if you were, you know, hypothetical question, if you were working at ABC, what type of stories that you saw within the print media would you may have uh, well, gone after? Well, first of all, I'm an unusual because I, I'm exposed to coverage all around the world. I'm not just focused on American coverage. So I can see what's being reported in England, what's being reported by Al Jazeera, what's being reported in the, in the Middle East and whatnot. And often uh, it's very different types of information and, and, and the contexts are very different. So, you know, the problem is once you get locked into a logic, you know, it's like a certain TV logic. Once you frame the story, say this is the story and only this is the story, then other information gets screened out immediately. And that's one of the problems, that we're getting a kind of script, a kind of storyline. You know, and this is what the administration did very well in this war. They, they used storytelling techniques rather than political pronouncement techniques. Okay? They told the story because they knew Americans respond to that. And can you give us some examples of what kind of story? Well, Jessica think? Lynch would be a good example well, okay. of okay. one story later on in the war. But the whole thing about, you know, Iraq... Uh, uh, you know, there was a propaganda war going on, information warfare, to discredit anything the Iraqis said, not to give them a real an opportunity to explain their case, not to go to third parties who might have other points of view that would be relevant to all of this. It, it was presented, you know, in a way as a kind of boxing, uh, you know, event, the world championship of war. And, the, you know, we were going to kick his butt. And that was basically, the, and Americans were saying, yeah, let's go do it. You know, after all, look what he did to the World Trade Center. You know, 44% of the public thought that there were Iraqis on the planes that hit the World Trade Center. Where did they find that out? It wasn't even reported. It was an inference. It was an impression. It was nonverbal communication. It was like, you know, an effort to, to demonize the other guy. And if people believed it. They connected dots that weren't there in their head. Okay. And uh, can you talk about the, the pattern of the, the Bush administration to try to discredit the UN inspections process and how the media in a way adopted that well you know the 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 UN uh, was essentially particularly by the conservative media okay, hold on a second, just, what happened just uh, the, yeah. so, okay. the, you know the, the UN was treated as some sort of foreign organ you know on American soil you know and it was like the enemy I mean the Murdoch press attacked the UN as, as uh, you know, cheese, uh, you know, eating surrender monkeys, you know, the, the United States uh, media, George Will and others said, the U.S. should pull out of the U.N. because the U.N. is clearly hostile to our agenda, dominated by these small countries that are trying, you know, to control everything. And they, you know, kind of obstructing, they're full of contradictions, they're full of hypocrisy. We are pure, they are not, you know, and this was the, the line that we saw. Most people don't know much about the U.N. Actually, 62% of the American people support the UN. There's a high approval rating for the UN, but they don't really get much information about the UN. And in this particular case, you know, when you start talking about, you know, UN resolution, Security Council resolution 12.12.4.3 and subsection 2, and probably, you know, your mind glazes over. You can't pay attention. What is this about? And people are speaking in foreign languages with translation. We never see that on, te on American television. So it was foreign. It was something that uh, it was very easy to characterize. You know, when, when, uh, when um, uh, Colin Powell went to the UN, he tried to use modern communications techniques. You know, he went to a PowerPoint presentation. He went to pictures and audio and, you know, to prove his case. And afterwards, people say it was brilliant. You know, now Powell is apologizing for it, saying, well, he was badly advised. He didn't have all the facts. You know, it was just not true. But it sounded good, it looked good, and, 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 and in television, perception means more than reality. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. That's a great point. Let's just uh, stop for uh, 10 seconds to get a little bit of room time.